Hello and welcome to Los Angeles Union Station. Today we're climbing the west coast of the United States, riding 34 hours from here to Seattle on board Amtrak's Coast Starlight. Amtrak's Coast Starlight runs along the west coast of the United States, connecting Los Angeles with Seattle. Our northward journey on the Starlight begins by following the coast past Santa Barbara to San Luis Obispo. The tracks then ascend the mountains, mirroring Route 101 to Salinas in San Jose. The Starlight hugs the east coast of the San Francisco Bay, arriving in Oakland just past sunset. Our ride moves farther inland towards Sacramento, the sun meeting us in Mount Shasta in Northern California. The Cascade Range fills the windows as we cross into Oregon, our train stopping at Eugene and eventually Portland on the other side. Washington is the third and final state through which the Starlight passes. Vancouver and Tacoma are our two major stops ahead of our final destination of Seattle at the end of the line. We'll cover a total of 1,377 miles on our ride today, with a travel time of 34 hours. Constructed in the 1930s, Los Angeles Union Station is the largest passenger terminal in the western United States. With a total of 14 tracks, Union Station serves almost 110,000 daily passengers. The vast majority of passengers are commuters using LA's Metrolink rail service to get to and from downtown, though many still use Amtrak's intercity and long-distance services. LA Union Station is truly a masterpiece, encapsulating that golden era of rail travel in the US. The station hall features high ceilings and chandeliers, gold accents, and a gorgeous tiled floor. Union Station serves as the main hub for all but one of Metrolink's services, as well as Amtrak's Pacific Surfliner, Southwest Chief, Sunset Limited, Texas Eagle, and of course, the Coast Starlight. The departure board in the main hall displays our train, Amtrak Coast Starlight number 14, as on time, although no track number is shown for the time being. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about finding a place to wait ahead of departure, because our sleeper ticket grants us access to LA's Metropolitan Lounge. The lounge is rather difficult to find if you don't know where to look. There are no signs for it out in the main hall, but if you head past the Amtrak ticketing desk towards the rental car services and then hang a left, you'll see what I believe is the only sign for the lounge. Taking the stairs up, we reach the front door. The lounge is quite small but quiet, with a good mix of tables and lounge chairs for waiting passengers. In addition to being a quiet place to relax, the lounge also offers complimentary snacks and drinks. The drink selection includes coffee, juice, water, and plenty of sodas. Amtrak provides a selection of chips, cookies, prepackaged pastries, and a few other small options for snacks. I of course chose a cup of coffee to begin the morning, paired with a coffee cake and a Struppwaffel. One thing to mention here is that although meals are complimentary for sleeper passengers, snacks and drinks outside of mealtimes are not, so I highly recommend stocking up on the lounge selection or grabbing something from the store in the main concourse. Our wait in the lounge would have been quite pleasant had the station staff decided not to test the emergency alert system, the alarm blaring out from the speakers around the station. Fortunately, boarding begins soon after our arrival, a member of staff escorting the crowd of waiting passengers out to Track 10. Waiting for us out in the California morning is, uh, nothing. It turns out that our train was still being moved from the depot, so we've got a few minutes before our actual departure time. Passing the time is easy, as LA Union Station is never quiet, a Pacific Surfliner pulling in as if to prove my point. All eyes turn towards the end of the platform as a set of Superliner coaches begin to back their way down Track 10. The Coast Starlight is finally here. Our train today includes three sleepers, one dining car, one observation car, two coach cars, and a single baggage car. Leading the Starlight are two of Amtrak's brand new Siemens ALC42 locomotives, numbers 306 and 320. Our room is in car 1432, the rearmost sleeper on today's train, and after checking in with our sleeper attendant, we can climb aboard. Heading upstairs and down the corridor, we find room number 8, our home for the next 34 hours. 
Boarding is incredibly efficient, and we barely have enough time to get comfortable before the starlight rolls out of LA, beginning our 1400 mile adventure. As we head out of Los Angeles, I just want to take a moment to say thank you for 10,000 subscribers. When I first started this channel two years ago, I never thought I would see anything close to that kind of following. It's been a long road to get here, and I couldn't have done it without each and every one of you. Seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. By far the best aspect of being in the last car on a train is the incredible rear window view. Although it's a gray day, the rear window still provides a great view of downtown LA and the network of tracks leading in and out of Union Station. Our train heads up the LA River, passing Burbank Airport as we pick up speed. Through Simi Valley, our train is forced to a crawl, the single track ahead occupied by a southbound surfliner from San Luis Obispo. Surfliner cleared, our train resumes track speed, twisting away between the fields of Camarillo. Despite our morning departure, lunch is the first meal served on board. Both lunch and dinner on the Starlight and all long-distance trains require reservations, which are made through the dining car attendant. I chose an early dining slot to give us the best chance of being seated on the ocean side of the train, as our room was unfortunately on the mountain side for a ride north. Just as I had hoped, the attendant seats us at a table on the coast side of the train, right as the ocean comes into view. Seating in the dining car is set up in tables of four. Amtrak staff will seat you with other groups to fill said tables, so get ready to make some friends along the way. Amtrak's western long-distance routes serve the traditional dining menu, which includes fresh-cooked options for breakfast and lunch, plus a three-course meal for dinner. For our first lunch, I went with the Monte Cristo grilled sandwich, paired with a side of kettle chips. Though not the most visually appealing, the sandwich was delicious. The savory meat and cheese, complemented by the sweet egg-battered toast, was great, and the kettle chips rounded out the meal quite well. As we dined, the coast of California continues to roll past, the waves of the Pacific crashing against the shore. Lunch comes to a close with a small dessert selection, offered our brownie or a butter cake, of which I chose the former. As we would later learn, dessert is supposed to be plated with a selection of syrups on top, but our regular packaged brownie still tastes great. The morning event concluded, and we can finally take some time to check out our accommodations. Amtrak's roomette is the smallest and cheapest sleeping accommodation offered on board. The 6.5 by 3.5 foot room includes two bunks with enough space for two adults. Stepping inside, we can close the door and blinds for some extra privacy. In their daytime configuration, roomettes feature two comfortable seats, the upper bunk stored away in the ceiling. For one passenger, there's more than enough space, though things get quite cramped with two people. The bar beneath each seat reclines the seat back into a comfortable lounging position, although with two passengers and both seats reclined, there really isn't enough space for both people to sit comfortably. Each seat comes with a single pillow, which is pretty comfortable, though I think you can ask for more if need be. Between the two seats are two complimentary water bottles, the tray table, safety information card, menu for our journey, and a nice welcome message from Amtrak's Vice President of Customer Services, Robert Jordan. The tray table lifts up and folds out across the space between each seat. It's large enough to hold two smaller laptops and was quite clean. 
The rearward seat includes a reading light, the room's temperature controls, the dial for which had long since departed, and the room's singular outlet. For two passengers who likely have one or more devices, having a single outlet is not nearly enough. Fortunately, I planned ahead and brought a power strip, a must-have item for long-distance Amtrak travels. The forward seat includes its own reading light, the volume controls for PA announcements and music, plus the attendant call button and master light controls. To the side of the forward-facing seat are the stairs up to the second bunk. Below these is the trash can, while on top sits a set of shampoo, conditioner, and body wash. Opposite the staircase is the only official storage space, with a deep but narrow hold for personal belongings. Above the storage space are two coat hangers with complimentary towels in the cubbies below the room's light fixture. The AC is controlled via the ceiling vent and associated flow lever to the side. Above the seating area is the top bunk, which folds down when needed. The top bunk holds the bedding for the lower bunk and the blankets for both passengers. We'll have a look at the beds themselves once night falls, but for now, it's back to enjoying coastal California. If you're enjoying the video so far, why not hit that subscribe button? It's totally free, and it really helps support the channel. If you want to go the extra mile with your support, then feel free to check out the channel's Patreon or become a channel member. Patrons and members get their names in the video, access to exclusive weekly posts, and even the opportunity to vote on future videos. If those perks pique your interest, then click the links in the top right or in the description below to learn more. It's unfortunate that today ended up being rather gray, but it doesn't matter much as the views don't need sun to be pretty. And moving to the rear makes the coast just that much more stunning, the tracks winding away behind us mere feet from the Pacific. All good things must come to an end, our tango with the ocean wrapped up as the tracks head inland. The Coast Starlight's route wraps around Vandenberg Space Force Base, the launch point for SpaceX on the West Coast. The sun finally breaks through the cloud cover as we approach San Luis Obispo, the blue skies complementing the surrounding greenery as we wind our way through the valleys. The foothills of the mountains greeted us upon arrival to San Luis Obispo, our first fresh air stop for our ride. Stepping out into the California heat, we can admire the coast starlight in all her glory. The sleek steel of our superliner stretches far into the distance, their uniform bodies merging into one single unit. Superliners may be pretty, but it's what's at the front that really takes the cake. Leading Train 14 today are two of Amtrak's practically brand new ALC-42 locomotives. 306 and 320 have the honors today. The former painted in Amtrak's Phase 6 livery, while the latter wears the new Phase 7 colors. I have loved these locomotives since day one, and seeing them in person just reaffirms my initial assessment. The ALC-42 is a huge step forward in terms of looks from the SC-44s. Gone is the flat, angular front end in favor of a rounded nose and streamlined facial features. Plus, those headlight covers give each locomotive an aggressive and powerful demeanor. I'm torn between the two liveries for which one is my favorite. As a standalone locomotive, I think that Phase 6 livery just barely edges out the Phase 7. The rear portion a callback to the old Amtrak logo. In a full set of painted coaches, though, the Phase 7 wins easily, and we'll see that in the near future with the Siemens Aero train sets. 
The yellow aboard call is made as we return to the rear of the train, the remaining passengers making their way back on board before we head on north. The next segment of the Starlight's route takes us up into the mountains, and to do that, we need to traverse the Cuesta Pass. The pass runs 11 miles through the southern Santa Lucia range, ascending 1,000 feet over the course of the climb. Cuesta Pass is a well-known rail fanning spot, with its two horseshoe curves making for some fantastic photography. The beginning of our ascent is marked by the crossing of the San Antonio Creek Bridge, a sight soon eclipsed by the fantastic views around the horseshoe curve. It starts off with a few sharp curves before the land falls away, revealing our ALC-42s charging away at the front of our train. There comes a point once the train enters the curve where it appears as though we are not moving relative to the ground, but instead the ground moves relative to us, like a record gliding under the playhead of a turntable. Clearing the horseshoe, southbound Starlight number 11 passes us by, led by ALC-42s 314 and 322. The curves continue as we climb into the mountains, the landscape rising along with us for some truly spectacular scenery. Coming down the other side of the pass, the land levels back out, our locomotives picking up speed as we powered north towards San Jose. Amtrak offers two main types of sleeping accommodations on long-distance trains, roomettes and bedrooms. Amtrak's bedrooms are over double the size of roomettes at 48.75 square feet. With two full-size beds and an armchair, there's space for two adults, with an option for a third if needed. In their daytime configuration, bedrooms include one full-width sofa, with an armchair on the opposite wall allowing for three passengers to sit comfortably. The sofa seating is quite similar to our roomette, but because the bed sits widthwise instead of lengthwise, the bottom bunk is much wider than the roomette's when converted to its sleeping configuration. The second bunk is stowed away during the day, folding down from the ceiling using the lever in the center and the latch towards the window. Storage space is still limited, but much better than the roomette. There's easily enough space next to and beneath the armchair for a suitcase or two, plus the small closet next to the door can hold a few smaller bags. Bedrooms also include a sink, and more importantly, an ensuite bathroom and shower. The sink is fine, it's a little tired, but not bad all in all, plus two of the three outlets can be found next to the lighting controls. Below the countertop are two doors. The left opens to reveal extra cups, toiletries, and toilet paper, while the right holds extra hand and face towels. Behind the vanity is the combination bathroom and shower. The shower is virtually identical to the one downstairs, which we'll take a look at later, just with a toilet off to one side. It's small for sure, but it's much nicer than the shared facility for the rest of the car. Amtrak's bedroom is certainly a huge step up from the roomette, but the main reason I chose not to stay in one was the price difference. At double the cost for a roomette, there's a serious question to be asked if you really need the extra space. The hills pick back up as we approach San Jose, and the best place to enjoy the sights is from the Sightseer Lounge. Amtrak's observation lounge car is laid out with a combination of sideways-facing swivel seats on one half, with tables on the other. The windows are much larger here too, with sections that wrap up onto the ceiling for optimal viewing angles from any seat. Plus, with cocktail tables between the seats and footrests along the walls, it's a great place to relax and enjoy the ride. 
The lounge car also serves as the cafe car for coach passengers, the bar located downstairs. Gilroy marks the beginning of our brief stint in Caltrain territory, our train pausing here to let a southbound service clear the single track ahead. Fortunately, the commuter service is running on time, and it's only a few minutes before we're back on the move. For the first time on our travels, our engineer is able to open the taps on our two ALC-42s. Our locomotives release their combined 8,400 horsepower as our train rips through commuter stations at 80 miles an hour. Our dinner reservation is called just south of San Jose. <laughs> Dinner is a bit classier than breakfast or lunch, with white tablecloths and a full three-course selection on the menu. Our dining experience begins with an appetizer. Amtrak's starters include a caprese skewer, coconut-crusted shrimp, and a mixed green salad. For entrees, Amtrak offers their signature flat iron steak, a pan-roasted chicken breast, Atlantic salmon, or a rigatoni bolognese. For our first dinner, I chose the caprese skewers to start, with the flat iron steak as a main. A bread roll is delivered by our waiter as an appetizer to the appetizer. While we wait for our first course, something new appears over the tracks outside. Catenary wires. Caltrain's electrified territory begins here, just south of San Jose, and runs north into San Francisco. The first overhead segment was energized in August of 2022, and only a few weeks ago, Caltrain ran one of its new Stadler EMUs under its own power for the first time. A huge achievement and step forward in progress of Caltrain's work towards an electrified corridor. Speaking of those new EMUs, we get our first in-person look at these new train sets as we pull into San Jose, and oh boy do they look amazing. The sleek aerodynamic front ends combined with a stunning paint job are a killer combination, and if the interiors are as nice as anything else Stadler makes, they're sure to be a hit once they enter service. I'll do my best to be among the first passengers on board these new trains once service begins, so stick around if that's something you want to see. Our departure from San Jose is matched by a northbound Caltrain service, F40PH-2C number 920, pushing the consist of Bombardier bi-levels towards San Francisco. As we pull out of San Jose, our appetizer is served. The skewers came plated nicely with a drizzle of balsamic reduction over top. The fresh mozzarella and roasted tomato paired with the sweet and sharp balsamic was a great way to start out the dining experience. Caltrain's maintenance facility passes us by on the left-hand side as we enjoy our appetizers. The facility recently upgraded to host their new EMUs. The sun begins to kiss the horizon across the San Francisco Bay, and as it disappears, our main course is served. Amtrak's flat iron steak comes laid on a bed of mashed potatoes with a port wine sauce and caramelized onions on top, plus a side of green beans and carrots. The steak was actually pretty tasty, all things considered. Unfortunately, it had been under-seasoned before it was cooked, with the port wine sauce doing its job to make up for that after the fact, it actually did a pretty good job of that. Mine came a bit overcooked, but that wasn't really an issue as the meat was soft enough to cut and eat easily, though it was quite dry. The mashed potatoes had an interesting flavor, but they paired nicely with the steak, though the same can't be said about the veggies that felt too waxy for my liking. All in all, it was a pretty good entree. Not bad for a train steak, but it wouldn't be hard to find a better one at a regular steakhouse. Now, dinner is a three-course meal, which means dessert is next. There are three options offered for dessert, a white chocolate blueberry cheesecake, a lemon cake, and the option we'll be having, a chocolate toffee mousse. I don't know what I was expecting, but the dessert was huge! It looked great, doused in a helping of chocolate and caramel syrup, with a massive cross-section of toffee running down the center of the slice. It tasted incredible! The mousse was super rich and chocolatey, and the crunch of the toffee added a nice texture to the dish. The caramel sauce had quite a bit of salt in it, adding yet another note to an already amazing dessert. Unfortunately, I couldn't finish it. It was just too much, even for me. I think if there wasn't an appetizer or a bread roll, I would have been okay, but it's nice to know that Amtrak really doesn't skimp on the portions. 
All in all, the dinner experience was excellent. It started off well with a refreshing appetizer, stayed strong with a delicious main course, and ended off with a dessert that could rival those found in some high-end restaurants. Definitely a 9 out of 10. As dinner wraps up, night sets in, and our train comes to a stop at Oakland's Jack London Station. Day or night, the ALC-42s look great, 306's central headlights punching holes in the darkness ahead. We've got a few more minutes than scheduled as we arrived a bit early. The station left in an eerie silence once the last of the passengers boarded. What had been an early arrival here in Oakland soon turned sour as our departure time came and went. It turns out that one of the doors between the diner and the sleeper cars was stuck in the open position, requiring a repair crew to come out and fix it. The crew took their sweet time getting to us, and by the time we pulled out of Oakland, we were an hour behind schedule. Before we're off to bed, it's shower time. The shower for roomette passengers is located on the bottom floor next to the accessible bedroom. The shower room is divided into two spaces, a changing area and a shower stall. The shower is basic but functional, with a detachable shower head and temperature controls. The water pressure was surprisingly high, especially for a train, with both the warm and cold adjustment working well enough to get it to a comfortable temperature. In the changing area, passengers will find complimentary towels, soap, shampoo, conditioner, and body wash. All in all, it's not perfect, but it's certainly welcome after a long day of travel. Returning to our room, the seats have been folded down into their sleeping configuration, the bedding laid out on top. Climbing under the sheets, we can turn out the lights for a good night's rest. The morning light greets us through Northern California, and opening the blinds, we're greeted by none other than Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta stands at an impressive 14,179 feet tall, the second highest in the Cascade Range and the fifth highest in California. A potentially active volcano, Mount Shasta has erupted every 600 years for the past 4,500. Though not recently active, the USGS still regularly monitors Mount Shasta and rates it as a very high threat volcano. Now, normally the northbound coast starlight passes Mount Shasta in the wee hours of the morning, but thanks to our door debacle last night, we were far enough behind schedule to really enjoy this amazing sight. Coffee is a must-have this early in the morning, and fortunately there's a freshly brewed pot at the drink station by the stairwell, compliments of our wonderful sleeping attendant. The views of Mount Shasta continue as the tracks head northwest around the mountain. The two peaks of Mount Shasta and its satellite cone Shastina clearly visible from the north side of the mountains. Mount Shasta leaves our field of view as the starlight turns back north, prompting us to head to the dining car for breakfast. Breakfast is the only meal that doesn't require a reservation to be seated. Service opens at 6.30 a.m. and lasts until 9.30. Amtrak's breakfast selection is larger than I had expected, with five options in total. 
I decided to try the breakfast quesadilla, which comes paired with a side of roasted potatoes. Again, I was pleasantly surprised by the quality of food. The eggs in the quesadilla were fluffy, and the tortilla was very crispy. The potatoes were seasoned with a flavorful blend of spices, though the salsa could have done with a little more heat. As far as breakfasts go, I was quite happy with what I got. The landscape rose and fell as we enjoyed our breakfast, our train finally crossing into Oregon about an hour and a half behind schedule. Klamath Falls is our first stop in Oregon and the first smoke stop of day two. Despite its small population, there are still plenty of people getting on and off the train. Klamath Falls is also a crew change point for the Starlight, the new engineer taking over in lead locomotive 306. We've got a green signal, so it's back to the rear of the train ahead of the all aboard call in our eventual departure towards Seattle. North of Klamath Falls, the Coast Starlight runs along the east coast of Upper Klamath Lake. The marshland gives way to deeper waters, Mount Shasta visible in the distance behind us. Halfway up the lake, Mount McLaughlin rises up over the hills on the far bank, its snow-covered peak reaching 9,493 feet above sea level. Mother Nature also makes her appearance on the lake, a bald eagle landing among the reeds along the shore. The morning of day two is slow and relaxing, and soon it's time for lunch. For lunch today, I went with the Angus Burger, which was a great choice. The burger patty was well seasoned, and the fresh veggies added some nice crunch. Unfortunately, our burger doesn't come with fries, as all of Amtrak's sandwich options come with kettle chips instead. Of course, lunch also comes with a helping of fantastic views, and the Cascade range did not disappoint. Though a filling meal, there's always room for dessert. I opted for the butter cake instead of the brownie, which this time came on a plate with a topping of raspberry syrup. We begin our descent through the Cascades, our train winding back and forth through the switchbacks past Diamond Peak. The Coast Starlight splits the gap between Lookout Point Lake and Highway 58. The reservoir is a part of the headwaters of the Willamette River, which will follow north into Portland. Eugene is our next scheduled stop and is the southern terminus for Amtrak's Cascade service. Our fresh air break here has been cut short in an attempt to make up the hour and a half deficit accrued over the past 24 hours. Leaving Eugene, we pass a Union Pacific local train and later a waiting Cascade service. Leading is Cabbage F40PH 9250, followed by four Horizon coaches with SC44 1401 bringing up the rear. I only realized this in post, but just behind the Cascade service are three freshly painted Bombardier bi-level coaches. These three are waiting to be delivered to their final destination on the Altamont Corridor Express. The miles fly by as our train makes up time, passing freight trains as we go.
Our train pulls up alongside the Willamette River, crossing the West Bank via the steel bridge ahead of our stop in Portland. Portland is the longest stop on the northbound coast Starlight. Here, the train performs a full crew change, not just the engineer, while also dumping the linens, towels, and trash from the previous day and a half's travels. The longer procedures here give us extra time to head inside and check out the station, and more importantly, the station lounge. Tucked inside Gate 5 is the Metropolitan Lounge. The lounge is only accessible to business class passengers on Amtrak Cascades and sleeper passengers on the Coast Starlight or Empire Builder. The lounge is small but appears to have been recently renovated. There is plenty of space for probably one train's worth of passengers, but should two be departing at the same time, it would definitely get overcrowded quickly. Amtrak offers a similar suite of complimentary snacks and beverages as we saw in LA, though the coffee machine was out of order so no afternoon pick-me-up for us. Boarding, or really reboarding, begins, and we join the line of passengers heading out to Track 5. In between us and our train is yet another Cascade service. This train is led by Cabbage F40PH number 9253 in the iconic Cascade's green and brown livery. Our time in Portland comes to an end as we climb back aboard, the Coast Starlight rolling on towards Seattle. Departing Portland, our train must cross back over the Willamette River. Due to some freight traffic ahead, we slow to a crawl, letting southbound Cascades Train 505 pass us by. Train 505 is operated today by one of Amtrak's Talgo train sets. The Spanish-manufactured sets owned by the Oregon Department of Transportation are the only two operating in the U.S. today, and are the only train sets currently operated by Amtrak outside of the Northeast Corridor. Of course, we'll have a look at the Talgo sets in a future video, or maybe even two, but we're back on the move, crossing the Willamette and Columbia Rivers. Our 34 hours on board concludes with one final meal, dinner. For dinner today, I opted for the Caprizi skewers again, with the rigatoni as a main. I was skeptical of the rigatoni and its plant-based meat sauce, but it was actually really good. The pasta was well cooked and the sauce was a nice blend of sweet and savory, balancing the tomatoes with the plant-based meat. Again, the main was paired with a side of veggies, which left the same impression as last night, overcooked and waxy, but with a bit of salt and pepper, they weren't half bad. As with all meals, dinner comes served with a plentiful helping of beautiful views, Mother Nature treating us to some spectacular shots of the Columbia River as we powered northward. Main finished dessert is served, a slice of blueberry cheesecake. Again, the dessert was fantastic. The cheesecake was a perfect blend of sour tang and sugary sweet, with the blueberries adding a fresh note on top. Served with a side of whipped cream and topped with some white chocolate shards, Amtrak has created yet another fantastic dessert. We part ways with the Columbia River, meandering through the Cascade Wilderness before entering Sounders commuter rail territory. Tacoma is the Coast Starlight's penultimate stop. Only a few passengers board as most disembark and our train carries on. As we savor our last few minutes on board, our attendant comes through and informs us of something interesting. We were the only passengers remaining in our sleeper. It just so happened that everyone else had disembarked in Tacoma, leaving us as the only occupants for this entire coach. Our final miles turn from rural to suburban and eventually urban, Seattle's Boeing Field the final landmark as we approach the city center. With the sun in its final stage of its descent toward the horizon, our train slows to a crawl. And almost 36 hours after leaving Los Angeles, we arrived at Seattle's King Street Station.
With a final goodbye to our roommate, we head downstairs and out into Seattle. Adventure now over, it's time to bring today's video to a close. If you've stuck around this far, I just want to say thank you. I know this video was a long one, but I thoroughly enjoyed the Coast Starlight experience, and I wanted to do my best to share it all with you. And of course, I want to say thank you again for 10,000 subscribers. 10k has been a long time coming, and I really could not have done it without each and every one of you. Next week, we'll actually be back in Los Angeles to take a look at Metrolink's Aero, the newest commuter service in California. If you're new around here, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button down below. It's totally free, and it really helps support the channel. There's a lot more incredible content on the way, so stick around if you want to see more. If you want to go the extra mile with your support, then check out the channel's Patreon or become a channel member. If you too want your name in the video, access to exclusive weekly posts, and even the opportunity to vote on future videos, then click the links in the top right or the description below to learn more. But anyways, that's all I have for today. Thanks for riding with me, and I'll see you in the next one.